Hello. Hi, this is Padma Ingua, and thank you for attending today's uh, webinar about photographing places of worship. Um, and thank you, Pictas, uh, for inviting me to be an instructor in your academy, and I'm really honored. Um, so I just want to say a couple of quick things about myself because this um, I have a lot of ground to cover and uh, we only have 60 minutes to do that. And I also um, want to point out that if you do have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat, but I will not be answering them until end, towards the end, only because I, again, a lot of ground to cover and I want to give out as much information as possible. Um, so I am Padma Ingua. I am from New Jersey in the United States, and I am not a full-time photographer, but I've been photographing for almost a decade, and um, I teach, I lead workshops, and I also have a full-time job that is not photography related, and I never studied art uh, growing up. I haven't traveled much until I was 40 years old. I have not attended a church until I was 43 years old. So I just want to give you a background as to where I started to where I am right now. And um, some of the techniques that I'm going to show you, um, I hope to get through all my presentation today. Uh, I'm hoping that through this webinar, I'm going to at least motivate, motivate two people. And if you are inspired, please let me know and reach out to me, tag me if you can. And if you do need any advice, uh, also reach out to me and if I can help, I will. All right, um, so uh, my website, you can go to www.padmaswall.com and you will see a lot of different things that I do. Uh, photographing places of worship is one of the things that I do. I also do long exposures. And I started off with flowers actually, and I do teach uh, floral photography. I specialize in light box photography. And mostly I specialize in a technique called Vodorama, which is call, uh, also called vertical panorama of churches and cathedrals and uh, any kind of indoor gigantic structures. And if you go to my website, you will be able to see some of the examples. And you can follow me on social media, on Facebook, Instagram. I'm also on 500 Picks. And my email is pingua at gmail.com. If you have anything uh, that is related to places of worship, or even more interesting, if you have any great churches or museums or cathedrals or mosques or anything that are, you think that I might want to see, please drop me a note because I keep a big database of um, uh, all these uh, facilities so that whenever I have the time to travel, I would like to go. Uh, and uh, so on that note, I want to show you these two pictures and there is the next one. And uh, this is uh, Montreal, Canada, 2013, July. And I went there with my kids and then I saw that I got to see the Notre Dame because I haven't been to Paris, I don't know when I will be there. This is a replica of Notre Dame in Montreal. And I was taken, this is my first time at the church, in any church for that matter. And I, I photographed it, uh, no, no tripod. There were 600 people around me. They were doing a light and uh, sound show. And I took pictures, I was very, very happy, okay? And then I took this picture. I was very happy because it looked so good uh, on the camera, back of the camera come home, I see how blurry this is, look at that. And look at how blurry this is. And the, but the composition wise though, this is not bad composition wise. The, so there are a couple of things I realized that one, I am a sucker for uh, symmetry. I love symmetrical things. And I'm also a sucker for uh, magnificent structures with lots of light, lots of color and architectural details. And I also came to know that I need to improve my photography post-processing skills, of course, photography skills as well. I needed to buy a better camera, better lens. So there are so many things I learned just by this. I come home, I put it on the computer. I also realized I need a better computer. So anyway, and then 
uh, give me one second. All right. Um, then I went and started photographing things near my uh, hometown. I live in New Jersey, I said. This is a historic church. I was told that this is going to be sold out to uh, be uh, converted into condominiums. So I went and visited this church. This is a historic one for Americans. Historic means 100 years old or 80 years old, not 800 years old. So I went there and, oh my God, I fell in love with this color combination and all that. Sad to say that it's not there anymore. They demolished it. They converted it into uh, apartments and such. Anyway, so this is where my first good uh, church image that I made. All right. It only took me about four or five months of uh, seriously trying to learn about how to handle my camera, what settings are good, what is HDR. I Googled it. I found a person, uh, uh, at that time, very famous photographer called Klaus Herman. He is a German photographer and um, he wrote a book on Wodoramas, but I was not there at Wodorama level. So I thought I would just do single straight on shots. And then it took me two years from here to get here. This is a waterama, a vertical panorama, which is one, two, three, four, five, six frames. I took six frames, one, two, three, four, five, almost bending over to the, look at the back of the church and then stitch them together and then tone mapping it, all that. It took me two years to get to that level to 2016. All right, this is uh, St. Peter and Paul Cathedral Basilica in Philadelphia. Now, let's talk about how do you start with, where do you start and how do you end up at the finished image, right? So any genre, it doesn't matter. You have two components for any image that you take. The first one is the source image, which is the raw image right out of camera. And to get to that, you need either a tripod or you can do a handheld, right? Uh, but you need um, a good camera. I'm not a snob, but I don't like using my cell phone for this kind of stuff. I'm not saying cell phone does not take good pictures, it does. But for me, I use my cell phone as a reference uh, image, but I like to use my DSLR. And I use a, a, a full frame, but Klaus always used, uh, crop sensor camera and he, his images are 1000 times better, I would say. He's no longer in the social media. I don't know what happened to him, but if you have time, you can look up K-L-A-U-S-S-H-E-R-M-A-N-N -S -S -E -N -N, and uh, you can look up his portfolio by Googling him. Anyway, so these two I've taken is the same handheld. ISO 4000, yes, I shoot at 4000 if I have to. And um, at f4.5, this is a fish eye lens and uh, shutter speed 120th of a second and 140th of a second. I bracketed them, but I only bracketed two, uh, two, two images. So this is one, this is two, one step apart. And then the next component is the post-processing. Now, within post-processing, there are sub-components. Now, if you look at this, uh, the first component of post-processing, because I have taken those two uh, raw images bracketed, now I combine those two in Lightroom to make this. There are no other adjustments applied, not even white balance correction, nothing applied. I just merge them to HDR. Then... Then, so let's see, that's HDR. Okay, now I have to make sure that this is aligned properly. And there is, uh, you know, if it, it is not aligned then I need to transform it to make it aligned properly. Okay, so that's why I put this grid line to show me whether it is aligned or not. And this grid line is from uh, Lightroom. But you don't have to use Lightroom. You can also use Photoshop. I want to show you how to go here. You see these blue lines, those are from Photoshop. So you can do from either way. Now this gives you a better and clearer picture where this is the middle line and you see that this is not aligned properly, correct? 
had I paid a little bit more attention, then wherever I was standing, I probably would have been a little bit more careful. Uh, and sometimes, you know, when there are people in there, you see there's one worshiper here, there are two worshipers here. And I also went with two other photographers. They are in the back waiting for me to be done. So if I am in a hurry, I don't have a lot of time to actually properly compose. Um, I did my best, but then I have to come home and then deal with the consequences, right? Uh, but one major thing for me is look at the, uh, the Jesus here. I would have probably aligned it properly exactly to this window had I paid a little bit more attention, but in this case, that did not happen. But now my attention goes to this line is not properly aligned. And now if you look at this particular thing, this, I also see that the chair here has a little bit more gap here compared to this age does not. So I pay attention to all these things in post-processing, okay? And then this is my final image. This is tone mapped. What is tone mapping? Tone mapping is basically see if there is any noise, if there is any sharpening needed, if there is any color correction needed, if you have to highlight certain areas, if you need to put any vignetting, and if you need to um, you know, think, take any things away that you don't need. I generally try not to take things away and such. I don't do manipulation quite as much, but you see what I did here, right? I tried to achieve proper alignment. I tried to put in a little bit more focus here and on the ceiling, a little bit more light and such. So I, if I'm given a little bit more time, like more than 10 minutes, I would have done a, even a better job. I was in a hurry this morning to show you guys. Uh, this is shot two weeks ago in Chicago. All right, uh, so now let's see what we need to photograph, All right? Uh, DSLR, I would say, uh, phone, if you want to try, that's fine. Uh, wide angle lens for big picture, wider picture to showcase most of the church and fisheye lens uh, for distortions, which I love. And if you don't like fisheye lens because it is distorted and you don't like distortions, then go tilt shift lens for straight lines. And a telephoto lens, if you want to highlight any details, all right? And a tripod or a monopod, uh, but the problem is most of the churches don't allow tripod or a monopod, uh, but call ahead, see what their policy is, go to their website to check if they have any policies and such. An L plate is also essential. If you want to uh, you know, do a vertical shot and a horizontal shot, it's better to have an L plate on, on a tripod so that you don't need to move your tripod to get your composition right, all right? Uh, next, a remote trigger, important. Again, that goes with the tripod. If you're hand holding, it doesn't matter. A level, if your tripod has a level already in it, that's good. If your camera has a level in it, that's good. But if you don't have either one of them, having an external level would be very helpful to achieve proper alignment uh, or horizontal alignment. Now, please carry a lot of spare batteries, spare memory cards, because nowadays all these cameras are so, uh, you know, high resolution and all that. So they take big, big pictures and you end up taking a couple hundred per church at the minimum. So the memory cards become very essential to have extra. And also you're constantly chimping, so spare batteries. And this is all the advice I'm giving you with my experience, because how many times I ran out of batteries, how many times I had run out of uh, space in memory card that I need to delete, and that consumes more of my battery. So this is like a trap, right? So anyway, now a powerful fast computer for processing. I can tell you stories about whatever, but I'm not going to. All I can say is I saved up two years to get a top of the line computer uh, that was six years ago, uh, Dell Alienware with you know great uh, bells and whistles. And I have like two 14 terabytes hard drives inside, uh, one terabyte, uh, no, four terabyte SSD. And on top of that, I have four external hard drives. I have 200,000 pictures on one catalog for my places of worship and, and landscape images. And I have a hundred thousand images for my flowers. So to hold all this, to process all these, I need the fast computer. 
Now, you might ask like what settings, like, you know, enough about all that, right? Um, so if you can take a screenshot of this, or if you want to watch back the recording, that's up to you. But these settings, please make sure, don't take them too hard as like, you know, oh, she gave it to me, so it is written in stone. It is not. Uh, use your own discretion as needed, depending on the available light, depending on the dynamic range and all that. And also depending on whether you're using handheld or, uh, or you're doing the tripod shots and such. But if you're handheld, then 1600 to 4000 ISO. I actually shot with a 10,000 ISO uh, two weeks ago. And uh, oh, it came out not bad, actually. It is not really bad. Now, because I'm using uh, F14, uh, sorry, uh, 14 millimeter prime lens, I got away because very wide angle, I can get away with using 2.8 to 5.6. But if you're using a lens, for example, like a zoom lens, uh, 24 to 105, for example, uh, 2.8 might not work four is the minimum uh, thing. So you probably might want to use 7.1. So this is all depending on all these guidelines or depending on what lens you're using, also what camera you're using, whether you can handle or your camera can handle high ISO performance, so many things to consider. Shutter speed, generally no less than 160th. The one that I showed you before was 120th and 140th. I got away with it because I turned on my uh, vibration control uh, or whatever the axis stabilization, five axis uh, stabilization feature. So I got away with it, but generally I tried to keep it at 160th of a second or, or faster. And then auto bracket to three, or sometimes I do two, uh, one stop or two stops apart. Again, all depends on the dynamic range. So again, take this as a starting point and uh, refine it as you need to. Now, if you're on a tripod, your life gets a little bit easier. ISO 200 to ISO 400 and F5.6 to F8. Uh, that would, this is what I love. And then don't go to F22. Why? Because, you know, there are lights in the uh, cathedrals and churches that they become stars that I used to love them when I first started. And then I realized that it takes away from uh, the actual, the, the magnificence of the church. It uh, takes, it interferes with the image. It changes the look and feel of the image. And that's why I try to stick between these two, uh, F5.6 to F8. Even at, even at F8, you get sometimes starburst. Anyway, um, shutter speed does not matter, but uh, you know if you're using a aperture priority mode, uh, I do use aperture priority mode for most of the time. But if you're shooting in the manual mode and be mindful and uh, look for the crowds and surroundings, you know, try, again, um, pay attention to the crowds because they might come into your, into your frame and you might want to wait until they move and all that. And that's why the faster you go at it and then you can get away and then you're not disturbing anybody. But when I'm on the tripod, I try to do five auto bracketed images because then I have more to work with in the post-processing. Now for post-processing, the software that I use uh, is Lightroom mostly because Lightroom does a phenomenal job of giving me some kind of neutral HDR image. I also had Photomatics. I don't use that ever in the last six years. I used it maybe twice. Aurora HDR, I used it a few times. It's better. Then Photomatics doesn't give me like all those gaudy kind of HDR, but I still prefer a LR Lightroom. Now the software to process is I start off with Lightroom. I open it up in Photoshop and then I end up in uh, sometimes Luminar, not as a plugin, but in Luminar, I try to open the raw file or the TIFF file. But then I also use a lot of plugins uh, for my finishing. Nick is my go-to. I love it. Topaz is my next go-to. All my images shot about 2000 ISO go through Topaz denoise, eyes closed 100% of the time. And Topaz sharpen after the denoise. I do both steps, one after the next. And then Alien Skin gives me a little bit of nice filmy effect. I like to use their 
Fuji, Velvia uh, prototypes uh, or film types. I don't know what you call them, presets. Um, so Alien Skin, they changed their name to Exposure Software. Look them up. They're like very decent uh, effects that they have there. Now, all of these, I usually apply them around 70 to 80 percent uh, opacity. And that's why I try to go from Photoshop to any of these plugins, come back to Photoshop, and then I try to play with the opacity. Now, let's go through a little bit of etiquette, right? Uh, we all belong to different religions, every religion, every facility in the, within that religion, they have different rules particular to that facility. So try to observe their rules because in, you are in their space. Your personal opinions do not matter. You are in somebody else's house, follow their rules. Simple, right? Work sensitively and work discreetly. Somebody is praying. You don't want to be standing in front of them. You don't want to obstruct their view. You don't want to make big sounds. You don't want to do that. Do not use any flash. That is a big no-no, okay? If it is very, very low light, then shoot at 12,000 eyes. So if you have to, okay? Take many number of shots, whatever, but under no circumstances use flash. If you're in a cathedral and if you're using a flash, think about it. It covers 30 feet, 20 feet. What is even the point? I, because I've seen people using flash. I'm like, I'm a dumbass. Anyway, sorry for that. <laughs> Use of a monopod, better than a tripod because it's not taking up a lot of space. All right. Now let's talk about lenses. Um, if you're using tilt shift lens, tilt shift lens is very popular. Or lots of architectural photographers use it. It's a bit expensive. Uh, it costs you at the minimum 15, 1600 US dollars to more, but it gives you straight lines. It gives you great depth of field, even if you're shooting with 3.5 or four aperture. And there is a lot of learning curve because you have a tilting mechanism, you have a shifting mechanism. There are knobs that you need to master. If you're hand, hand holding it, it's a pain, but once you learn it, you cannot unlearn it. It's pretty decent. And so these are the kind of nice straight lines that you get. Look at that. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Do you see there are only two people here, two, three people? That's because I planned it in such a way. I went to St. Patrick's Cathedral on January 1st after people celebrated, this is pre-COVID times, uh, people celebrated uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve. People got drunk. They could not get up in the morning to go to St. Patrick's to, for the mass. So I was there at 6 a.m. and 20 minutes I was in and out. Uh, I went there seven times before for the shot. And guess what? Every time I couldn't even go halfway to the altar because it was packed with visitors. So that's the kind of planning that I do. And this is another church in Philadelphia. This is again St. Patrick's Cathedral. Now, fish islands, which is my greatest love. And the fish islands that I have is the cheapest one. I bought it on Craigslist for $260. Uh, it's a Sigma 15 millimeter. And I will never part with it. It has to die on me before I buy another one. Well, I bought another one, I don't use it. So uh, great depth of field. I shoot at f2.8 and it gives me great results. And there's a lot of barrel distortion, but it has a beautiful, extreme panoramic perspective, huge field of view, very strong distortions. But my sons, I have two of them, one hates them. And he says, that, mom, that is like completely distorted. I don't like it. But I tell him that, hey, you watch Arnold Schwarzenegger, or you watch all these sci-fi movies, nothing is real and you like them. So start loving this too. I am trying to get away from reality, showing real stuff in a different view. What's wrong with that? So some people love them. Some people hate them. That's okay. Get over, right? <laughs> Central part of the a frame with the fish islands when you take an image is mostly straight. And then the distortion starts around the central part. I'm going to show you some of the examples. But the more you get close to the subject, 
the larger the central part becomes, right? And then the distortion actually starts, um, you know, larger too. Anyway, um, if you tilt the lens upwards, it has a different kind of concave horizon. Down, it shows you convex. Don't ask me the definitions of concave and convex. If you have to, Google it. So this is a crypt in National Basilica in Washington, DC. And see how beautiful so the, this is straight, but the distortion is all around, right? And this is a tilted little bit. And I was in the choir loft, the second floor, and then looking down. So it has a different, different way of distortion. And I'm looking up a little bit, that has a little bit different distortion. This is straight on from the choir loft. I cannot give you these names of all these churches because I've been to 450 churches in last uh, eight years, nine years. So that is quite a bit. I actually been to 20 churches in last four or five weeks. So I have to add them as well, I guess. This is a Sadurk Cathedral in London. This is from Baltimore. Whenever you go to a church or a cathedral, ask them if there are any places that you might want to visit. The best people to ask these questions is a custodian, a janitor, or a security guard, or somebody. Those are the people that you want to make friends with so that they can tell you the secrets. Um, so sometimes, even though it is not prohibited for the public, it is not advertised as available. So you don't know. This, people can walk in because I did not even know it existed. So security guard told me that, hey, go down, you see this. So that's how I came to know. Now, a telephoto lens uh, for isolating objects. Truth be told, I don't use a lot of uh, telephoto lens, uh, but every now and then my heart goes for it. This is to zero in on paintings or stained glass windows or any uh, statues or little ornate things that I want to highlight. So this is a Church of Transfiguration in Cape Cod uh, in Maine. Oh, sorry, Massachusetts, sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, I wanted to zero in on the altar and that's what I got. This is a 70 to 200 lens. And I um, was hand holding this, I think about 2000 ISO. And I really loved it. This is a very small church. There is not much to photograph, but I see all these flags. I did not know what they meant but it still caught my eye. So I took out my lens, uh, 70 to 200, right? Now, planning the shoot. I, I'm not a patient person. Um, I am short tempered. I have high energy, very impatient, all that. But when it comes to photography, I am very patient. I plan quite a bit and uh, you need that. And know that there is no happenstance or you can just, can I just walk in? You have to know whether the church is open or not, first of all, and what time is their mass? Because if you walk in uh, while there is a mass, obviously you cannot enter. Even if you enter, you don't want people in your shot, like way too many people, all that. So you have to do your research and make sure that you have enough time to set up. And if you're not sure, then call them up, ask them, write to them through their website, pretty much every, church, cathedral, mosque. I see that they at least have a website. And if they don't have a website, they have a Facebook presence. There's some way to reach them uh, if you don't want to call them. Now, what to photograph? Well, altar, obviously we all want to do that, but then there are ceilings, there are organs, there are stained glass windows, then, then the light coming through the stained glass window that is falling on other things that you want to highlight that. And if you go to any Orthodox church, which I'm going to show you some examples, there are some beautiful, intricate paintings that you can highlight. And there are crypts, there are smaller chapels within a bigger church that you can go to and such. And also, while it comes to composition, leading lines usually work, that kind of composition works very well in a, a church setting, for sure. And don't forget to look up beautiful ceilings as well. And also try to close your eyes for a minute. And, and, and then seriously, I'm trying to tell you, like stand in front of 
uh, say alter, right? Look it up, take it all in, close your eyes, try to reproduce that image in your mind's eye and then see if there is anything that you can do. It works, I'm telling you, this technique works. Watch it, close your eyes, try to bring it up and see what, what wonders it will do, all right? And I love to use my fisheye lens to come up with different compositions and I am going to show you examples. And also when it comes to composition, in church photography, symmetry, asymmetry. By the way, when I say church photography, for me, it's, it can be a church, temple, mosque, it doesn't matter. I have The only thing that I have not photographed and want to um, is the temple. I'm a Hindu and I have a big temple nearby. I call them, I said, hey, um, you know, Hindu temple I'm talking about. And they said, no, photography is not allowed. I told them that, hey, Christians have no problem me walking in with my tripod or whatever, taking pictures. Yeah, why don't you go shoot churches then? I said, okay, I will do that. I've been to a mosque, a few mosques. I went to Abu Dhabi, Grand Mosque. I'll show you one image or two images. I went to Dubai, went to a few mosques, all, you know, all that. They didn't have any objection. I'm a woman, I'm Hindu. They didn't say anything, only their... Uh, um, Rule was to put, put an abaya, uh, and then I did that, and that's that. So temple is the one that I did not do. Anyway, enough said that. Um, so symmetry. This is one of the most common, 70, 80% of the, my images are uh, symmetrical, and symmetry is very pleasing. It gives you kind of a peaceful, pleasing um, effect on the audience that are looking at the image. And this is the example, right? Everything is nice and symmetrical. You know what you're looking at. Your mind will comprehend. There are no conflicts or anything, right? Whereas asymmetry is a little bit, you know, what am I looking at? What is she thinking? Like, does she know what she is doing? And all that. So let's see. So this is asymmetry. I like it. <laughs> I like to bend it a little bit. But this is an acquired taste. It did not come to me naturally. How I came to it is I had a friend who looking at my images and said, oh, this is too boring, very predictable. It's like vanilla. I said, okay, I'll show you. <laughs> so I started playing with it. Yeah, I have all these little things here I didn't want to delete because this is an old time church and it is going through some renovations and such. Actually, this is a basilica in Louisville, Kentucky. I wanted to highlight these worn out floors, but beautiful reflections in it, beautiful windows and all that. So asymmetrical um, composition works here. Same thing here. In my opinion now, I say that this kind of evokes an emotion it evokes thoughtfulness in the audience. It's, I'm not saying that it has to be pleasing. <laughs> you know, it can be like, what the hell is she thinking? Why is, why is it so confusing? So, but at least I'm making other people think about it. This is another church. One day we were walking through this uh, and oh my God, I saw the light of these windows from outside. I ran in. And this is the what I'm talking about. See this dapper light? It's coming from the other side of the windows falling onto this. And look at that. How beautiful is that? Let me do a quick time check. All right. Okay. Reflections. I'm going to give you one tip. That's worth some money. Okay. People don't pay attention to uh, reflections. They can be found and the floors, piano tops, baptismal fonts. And so let's look at the a second. Oosh. My keyboard is falling apart. Give me one second. Ugh. Okay, good. All right, so this is a piano top. And look at this here. This is a piano, the door hinge on the piano. I put my camera right on the piano, but just a little bit towards the edge. And 
because I cannot bring the piano to the middle of the church, it cannot be asymmetrical anyway, even if I try. But look at the reflections, right? So this is the tip, you can count on it. Anytime you see a piano, <laughs> try to put your camera on it. You can do this with your phone as well. Actually, you can put the phone right on. I have done many portraits actually uh, using a glass top table and then put the phone on the glass top table and then use the reflections. Um, so a couple of things, make sure that, um, you know, uh, you, your camera does not scratch the piano. That's very important. And if there is somebody who's watching, you might want to assure them that you're not trying to destroy the piano because that happened to me a few times with people like, do not put anything on the piano. Okay, and the next thing is, if the piano is white, it's not going to work because the white does not reflect very well, black does. Black, uh, kind of brown, that works very well. White does not work. Now, again, you see the piano hinge, just to tell you that I'm not lying about or it is not created in the post-processing, but it is created in camera. This is the reflection, oh, sorry, uh, hinge. And this is a church in Albany. Now, do you see all this starburst? Yeah, F16, that's why. Okay, and now you see the reflections in the floor. Okay, so I pay attention quite a bit. That is more important. If you're a photographer, you got to pay attention to the details. This is a baptismal font. And I put my camera right on the edge of the font, like, if you're not careful, you might drop your camera into the font and then the water obviously is going to ruin your camera, so be careful. But this font is only about two and a half feet wide. Two and a half feet wide, that's less than a meter, much less than a meter, okay? So think about that. Your wide angle lens makes it look big, really, really big. You should try that. Now also, if you're using different lenses, creates different outcomes. Check this out. This is a chapel next to World Trade Center. It withheld the bombing, and that's why they call it the little chapel that stood. So this is a piano. Again, I put my camera on it. This is a 14 uh, millimeter lens, and this is shot with a fisheye lens. Let me go back. That shot with my Sony with 14, shot with my Canon. So this is a little bit of a white balance uh, difference, but also compositional wise, composition wise, it's different. Different lens, this fisheye, that's a regular lens, big difference. This is another composition. This is a Duke University Chapel, and that's 14 millimeter lens. This is shot with my partner, Al. And this is um, a fisheye lens that I shot. Now, look up ceilings. Most of the churches and cathedrals have beautiful domes that you don't want to miss out. And by the way, this is a museum though. Look up also museums, just in case. This is not a museum, but this is a library of Congress in Washington, DC. And this is Sadurk Cathedral in London. This is St. Mary's in um, Annapolis. That is a fisheye. This is a tilt shift, big difference. Okay, there are other compositional elements that you can use. Now offer a tree basket, statues, candles, chandeliers, a lot of different things. Let's see. One example, I'm not going to explain everything because again, we have a lot more to cover. This is a chandelier. I told you, I'll show you the Grand Mosque of uh, Abu Dhabi. This chandelier is one of the best things I've seen. Oh my God. And this carpet here, this design matches this perfectly. And oh my God, I was in heaven when I was there. It was the most beautiful thing I've seen or one of the most beautiful things. This is a mosque in Dubai a cathedral in Albany, New York, somewhere in New York City. I did not know the meaning of these baskets until I went there. 
even the pulpits, you can use this as a leading line with the fish islands, you can make it interesting. The Christmas decorations, I go for anything and everything. And the candles, all these decorations, I can frame it so nicely. And look at this dapper light. This happens only a few times in a month. And when the sun is like uh, properly aligned, it seems. Somebody who works there told me, so I went in February of that year and only in that week that happened. But it happens like every month, but at certain time. Now, Orthodox churches that I mentioned, that is, I forgot the name of this church, but it's right outside of Washington DC in Maryland. Yonkers, New York. Also Yonkers, New York. I don't remember where, <laughs> but you get the point, you know, because everything comes to kind of, you know, together in my head at this point. This is Bronx, New York. This is Toronto, Canada. This is uh, Boston, Arlington, Virginia. So I just want to say one thing that I travel quite a bit. Most of the times I, well, I stay within the US because I also work full time and uh, there is only so much leave that I got. But my goal is to eventually go to uh, Rome and be there for like a couple of months and photograph the churches there, churches, cathedrals and all that. But sometimes when I go to these churches, they don't allow me to do anything inside. Either there is a function going on or photography not allowed. It only happened a couple of times. Or uh, if you go to a Mormon church, they, are not, they don't allow people inside there if you're not a Mormon, period. So if that's the case, this is what I do. I shoot outside, exteriors. This is a Mormon church right outside of Washington DC on the Maryland side. Christmas time, they decorate everything. So you can go and photograph whatever you want out from outside. This is a church in Boston. I couldn't go inside, but they had a reflecting pole. So I waited until blue hour and I sat there for three hours to, for the blue hour to come by. So I can do this. This is a church that was closed. We were passing by. I really like this dome. It is a small church. I still never went in, but I tried to showcase the form and there is nothing interesting going on in the, in the sky. So I just did a black and white. And I did a long exposure, but even that long exposure, I did not have ND filters. So I took 150 shots and I combined them in Photoshop to create that long exposure but I had my tripod luckily, but I love this beautiful construction of this. Now I told you I do Wodoramas. I am, I think I'm the only woman who does this technique in the world. There are a few men who do this as well, but I'm a little bit nutty in the way that I've done many, many Wodoramas. I'm going to show you some of the examples. So a wordorama, like I explained, is a vertical panorama. And you take about six to seven uh, vertical and then all the way to the back of the church uh, images. And then you take them into Photoshop. But there is a lot more process to it. I'm not going to try to explain it because it, it cannot be explained even in two hours. But basically, it is a lot of work. It takes about three to five days to stitch it and tone map it and make it into a finished image. You do need a powerful computer. So a lot of people don't do it. Also takes at least a year to master it. And a lot of people don't have the energy, patience, resources or whatever. So a lot of people don't do it. That's the reason why. And a lot of people are also not self critiques. So if you think that, <laughs> that your stuff is great on the first like attempt, then you're doomed because there is no room for improvement. So you've got to critique your own stuff and then say that, oh, there is, I can improve or I have to learn, uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, 
This is St. Patrick's Cathedral. I told you that was January 1st, there are only one or two people in there. Most of my images are from New York, New Jersey, within US basically. And then a couple of times that I've been to London and then UAE and Canada. But other than that, I haven't been to the most beautiful parts of uh, the world where there are many more churches, but one day I will. Grace Church. This is Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. You've seen this church. I showed you the baptismal font. This is our own New Jersey church, our own cathedral in New Jersey, which I love. National Cathedral, Washington, DC. This is the Grand Mosque of Abu Dhabi, my first handheld. I was extremely proud of myself for doing this. This is a mall. I cannot believe they made such a beautiful structure which would pass for a museum and made it into a mall. And this is National Library of Congress. This is Natural History Museum. Okay, my keyboard again falling apart. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is Oculus in New York City, again, a handheld. And now I'm going to show you a couple of other examples of what I do with my images in the post, just to keep my creative juices going. And also during pandemic, I went through this a little bit of a crisis where, uh, how do I say, what's happening? What is the purpose of all this? Why is God doing this? So you, I went through that phase of uncertainty and all that. So, but a core of me, still a believer, but it's like my edges are kind of blurred and everything is merging. Everything is like, it's, it's not working for me. I don't know what's happening. So all that, I wanted to put it into my photography. So I created that image that totally represents how my mind is at, was at the time. And then I took that and then made it into kind of black and white and tried, tried, tried to give creative age. Now, I'm not fully out of that yet, meaning I still have my doubts. I still don't understand how God created us and then he gave us so much heartache. But then how can I not believe in him? Because even with all this chaos, the sun still comes up, the moon still comes up. Everything runs in this universe on a timely basis. The flowers bloom at a certain point. They know exactly when to start blooming and all these things, how are they happening? Definitely it's not in human's control. So, so I know that part. So again, uh, that's a little bit of my um, interpretation that I want to put it into photography. And then I started working on this. Um, uh, series. Eventually, I want to make NFTs out of it. And I call this convergence or divergence, because all my uncertainty and certainty in my thoughts is merging together, converging, but I'm also diverging from my core belief. What is it? I don't know. So anyway, more experiments. On, I've already taken the shots. These are all the experiments I'm doing in post-processing in Photoshop, all right? And then I got myself a filter. It's called Whirlpool, W-H-I-R-L-P-O-O-L, Prism Filter. If you go to Amazon, you can look it up. So if you put it on your camera and you start taking pictures, you don't even need to do any post-processing on this. It creates these nice halos uh, and it creates this angelic looking, if you go to any, any statue or something and try to take pictures of it. So this is my latest obsession. And we are almost to the end. All right, so I have one favor to ask of you. I started to work on my NFT collection. First, I thought that NFTs were bad. Then I started thinking that NFTs actually are not that bad. 
it all depends on what you're trying to do with it. And my goal is to donate some of the proceeds to charity and use some of the money to go to Rome for two months and uh, fulfill my dream of photographing churches there. So if you have a minute or two, I would ask you respectfully to check my collection, see if you like any of it. The first collection is all about lighthouses that I've created using um, uh, artificial intelligence software, but the source images for that are mostly mine. And the second one is because I live near New York City, I've been there many, many, many times and took the images there. So I created some creative interpretation of New York City. And if you go there, see if you can check it out, that would be very helpful. And if you can buy it, I would even appreciate it. And that said, my email. And then I want you to know that I am also available for any kind of post-processing advice. If you have already been to say a church, you got some pictures, but you don't know how to process, or you want to improve your processing skills, reach out to me. I can do on Zoom one-on-one -on -one sessions or small groups, one or two people, or three people up to. And um, I do have a limited time because I work full time, but I can use that money to go to Rome again. <laughs> and uh, also don't forget to check Check up on me on social media. And uh, if you have anything else, please let me know. I'm going to stop right here so that I can take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Padma. It was really an amazing webinar. I have seen many great pictures and that was really awesome. Uh, now we've got Alda who said that she didn't get the name of the filter. I suppose the weird filter that you mentioned before. The weird filter, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm putting it in the chat. Whirlpool prism filter. You can um, put it up for everybody. Yeah. If you, yeah. Will... Okay, anything else? I'm also giving my NFT collection if anybody wants to check it out. One of them, yeah. Okay, any so is there, is there any other questions from you guys? No? Okay then. So if you don't have any questions, I would say thank you very much, Padma. It was really, really nice. And thank you everybody for joining us and check out PICTA's website and uh, all our upcoming webinars. So thank you very much and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.